Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Oh, it's more medical history. So exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing so much over the pandemic, um, and we've just had lots of medical things come up. Uh, but this time we're going to talk about early surgery, and I mean very early surgery. We're going to talk about Amboise Paré, who has been called everything from the gentle surgeon to the father of modern surgery. And he really, really did advance the field of medicine significantly during his 50-plus years in practice. And just for a level set, so you get a sense of how uh, ahead of of other things we've talked about he is. When we recently talked about Jean-Baptiste Denis in our two-parter about the development of blood transfusions, those events took place more than 100 years after what we're talking about today. And when we talked about, for example, uh, Scottish surgeon Robert Liston, who was famed for his speedy amputations, that was 300 years after Paré. And so first, though, to set the stage, we have to talk a little bit about barber surgeons and some of the other stuff that was going on in Europe regarding this trade leading up to the 16th century, which is when Paré was doing his work. And then we will get into Amboise Paré's story. Yeah, when you sent me, um, when I asked what you were working on this week and you told me, I Googled it and saw the word surgeon and then saw the year and kind of went, whoa. Mm-hmm. Like we've talked about some very early surgical history before, but it was this was one that jumped out at me. So, yes, I'm glad you picked it. Yay! So before we get into Paré's story, as Holly just said, we need to have a little overview of barber surgeons and where they were at when he was working in this field. We have mentioned barber surgeons before. I don't think we've really talked about the origins of barber surgeons and how exactly we got to a point that you would hire the same person to shave your face as you would to extract a tooth or amputate a limb. So, (laughs) wide range of job responsibilities. It seems like such a strange grouping today, but for a long time, it was totally normal. Yeah, and we know that specialists in grooming go all the way back to ancient Egypt, but there's this question of, like, when did the cosmetic occupation take on all of these other duties? So the answer to that lies in the Hippocratic Oath. We won't read the whole thing. It is quite long. It includes a lot of language about holding your teacher in the same regard as your parents and administering healthy diets and all kinds of other things. But the section of it that's germane to today's topic is this, quote, I will not use the knife, not even on sufferers from stone, but will withdraw in favor of such men as are engaged in this work. So we should note two things here, because you also may have heard or read a different version of the Hippocratic Oath. First, the oath was originally written in Greek, so obviously there are translations. Second, there is a modern version that is quite different, and you may have heard that one. That one, though, was not written until 1964, so long, long after Amboise Paré's time. It was written by Tufts University Academic Dean of the School of Medicine, Louis Lasagna. That phrase, though, about not using the knife on patients meant that if somebody did need surgery, there had to be a different profession who could handle it. Physicians could take care of their patients in every way that didn't require surgery, but then if things reached a point where a knife was involved, then the patient needed to be handed off to someone else. So a surgeon, or very often a barber surgeon. So from their beginnings which had the religious significance of being in charge of things like tonsuring clergy, barbers over time adopted additional duties as standard for the barber trade. Needs like bleeding or tooth extraction were handled by barbers for the simple reason that in 1163, monks, who up to that point had been providing services like bloodletting, were then forbidden to do so by a papal decree issued by Pope Alexander III. So at this point, Hippocrates has said that physicians can't do it, and the papal decree said that uh, none of the monks could do anything like this. So additionally, actual trained surgeons were pretty thin on the ground. Uh, So (laughs) the role of the barber continued to expand to include more and more complex procedures until barber-surgeon had emerged as a career. Yeah, basically, basically somebody in Europe's got to do it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's where we landed. 
And London, the Worshipful Company of Barbers, which was founded in the early 1300s and still exists, was a guild for the barber profession, and it supported this expanding role. But there were also surgeons who were just surgeons. They had made their careers specializing in that field, so naturally this led to some tension. Barber surgeons felt that they were filling a really vital need for their clientele, and they were. But surgeons felt that barber surgeons were beneath them, and they didn't have the same skill level because they hadn't learned Latin or gone to university, and that these combination shops that handled the tasks of multiple professions should really just be relegated to the country, where professionals in general were a lot more sparse. But most surgeons were employed by royal or high-ranking households exclusively, so even in the city, there was still a lot of need for somebody who could do all of this stuff. To compound matters, a lot of doctors thought that some of the tasks that a barber surgeon could perform, like bloodletting, was really beneath them. In a 1962 paper, R.S. Roberts wrote, quote, Despite the pretensions of the physicians, it was impossible to keep medicine, surgery, and pharmacy as separate activities, and a more general form of practice which combined all that was necessary did develop in London just as quickly as the provinces. There was so much strife in London over all of this that Henry VIII's surgeon Thomas Lineacre used his influence with the king to ask that some sort of supervisory guidelines be put in place for surgeons. Similar requests for medical regulation came from other scholars who had the king's ear. And for just about the entirety of Henry VIII's reign, there was this sort of constant effort and struggle to get London on par with other cities in terms of medical licensing and education. In 1540, the Company of Barber Surgeons was formed, and that combined the two professions. Although surgeons and barber surgeons were still separate things, but under this larger group, medical care was regulated. In France, the two had joined under one guild 80 years earlier. In 1383, during the reign of Charles VI of France, the king's first barber and valet was made head of that guild. But then Paris had its own complexities and conflicts in the medical field. Barber surgeons were sometimes called doctors of the short robe, with doctors of the long robe being used to refer to members of the confraternity of saint Came. These were theoretically surgeons, although they often had sort of a snooty attitude. It seems about performing surgery themselves. These doctors of the long robe had a lot of friction with the university-trained physicians and with the barber surgeons, This made Paris a very contentious place to practice medicine at all. It's so, all of the posturing that goes on in the hierarchy of these medical fields is very fascinating to me. There was reform to this very problematic system just before Amboise Paré was born. The Faculté de Médecin decided on a course of action to try to alleviate the tension by making barber surgeon a legitimate licensed title. That meant the barber surgeons could attend classes at the university and they had to take two exams after completing their training in order to be licensed. As part of this reformation, the existing surgeons could move up in title to doctor's regent at the faculté. So this ended up consolidating these three factions into two, and it elevated both barber surgeons and surgeons. And while this did not by any means eliminate all of these problems and posturing, it definitely did improve things. And Amboise Paré was working in the medical field right in the middle of this unique and sometimes tense culture We'll talk about his life and career in just a moment, but first we will pause for a quick sponsor break. Amboise Paré was born in 1509 or 1510 in Bourg-en-Sons in western France. And his path in medicine was actually set fairly early on. Both he and his brother were set on educational tracks to become surgeons by their father, who was not in the medical field but did well for himself as a master carpenter. One of the key pieces of education that a surgeon needed was Latin. And a working knowledge of Latin was considered vital for that career. But Amboise never quite mastered it. That was even though he had been sent to a boarding school that was run by a chaplain who could focus on that language. Yeah, (laughs) there was a lot of very dedicated 
educational effort to getting him to learn Latin, but that was just not happening. Uh, when he was in his early 20s, Paré traveled to Paris to pursue a position as an apprentice, despite his Latin still lacking. He did get an apprenticeship with a master barber surgeon, so that at that point was the only possible path because that Latin requirement was not quite as vital for a barber surgeon. He didn't really get a whole lot of time with the surgeon part of the job, though. He mostly tidied up in the shop by sweeping hair, and he was occasionally allowed to give beard trims. This was not, we should say, because his mentor was particularly cruel. The shop just had to be maintained during business hours, so most apprentices faced kind of similarly challenging schedules. There just wasn't really a way to attend medical lectures because of this, unless they were lectures that were given unusually early in the morning or late in the evening. So study of the surgery side of the job was usually done via late-night reading, although there were some procedures like leeching that were taught there hands-on in the shop. Paré accepted this sometimes grueling schedule, and he applied himself to get to his goal of being accredited as a barber surgeon. But the diploma from the master barber was really just the first step. The next phase of his education was pretty similar to the way a modern medical doctor goes through a residency training period. For Paré, this meant a surgeon trainee position at Hôtel Dieu de Paris, starting in 1532. Uh, As an aside, the Hôtel Dieu may one day be its own episode. It is the oldest operating hospital in the world. It still operates, and it has its roots reaching back at least 1,100 years. But for the purposes of Amboise Paré's story, the key here is that the Hôtel Dieu had started as a home for the poor of Paris that eventually added medical care for the residents to its mission, and it had actually become essentially a teaching hospital by Paré's time. There was also sort of a weird setup for surgical training because the hospital was run by the church, and the church looked upon cutting a human body as anathema. This meant that any kind of actual surgery that Amboise Paré was able to perform had to be on deceased patients. The hospital was packed, though. It was often really overcrowded with patients having to share beds, so he had plenty to do. Over the course of four years, he provided care to thousands of residents, including through a cholera outbreak, and he studied surgery in books and by doing autopsies. But even though he had done all this hands-on training and work to qualify for a surgical license, stories go that this lack of Latin continued to hold him back. He was not able to obtain a license. But really, most accounts indicate that it wasn't so much the Latin issue, it was that he was too poor to take the required certification exam. Yeah, the Latin holdback is like a nice story, but it really seems more to have been a financial issue. Regardless, though, of which of those factors was the one holding him back, he ended up on another path, and that was one that would enable him to practice medicine even if he did not have a license. And that was as a member of the French military. Paré was able to get a position as the surgeon attending the general Marshal de Montjean. And the impact this role had on the way Paré practiced medicine, and consequently a lot of other people, uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of the episode we did about famed chef Auguste Escoffier. Because if you heard that one and recall it, Escoffier had learned to improvise really impressive meals for the troops that he cooked for with minimal supplies during his time in the military. Uh, And Amboise Paré, in kind of a similar move, improvised treatment of wounds when his medical supplies ran low. Paré described a key moment in his military career during the 1537 Siege of Turin when he ran out of the oil that they normally boiled to cauterize amputation and gunshot wounds. This was a treatment that he had always felt was often really damaging and risky to the soldiers. So... It is very easy to the modern ear to immediately hear that whole boiling oil thing and think, whoa, what were they thinking? They're so foolish. Keep in mind, though, this is really still pretty early in the use of gunpowder artillery in war. Uh, There are references to artillery on battlefields as early as the mid-14th century, but in the years between then and when Paré was deployed, the use of such weapons had grown pretty slowly. And the Italian wars, which Paré found himself part of as France and Spain battled over control of Italian territories, were marked by a significant uptick in the amount and variety of firearms used. And there was still a commonly held belief that there was poison in gunpowder, so the oil was thought to somehow counter that. Paré listed the weapons of war in his writing as, quote, all sorts of mines, countermines, 
pots of fire, trains, fiery arrows, lances, crossbows, barrels, balls of fire, and all such fiery engines and inventions. They are certainly a most miserable and pernicious kind of invention, by which we often see a thousand unsuspecting men blown up with a mine by the force of gunpowder. For these modern inventions are such as easily exceed all the best appointed and cruel engines which can be mentioned or thought upon in the shape, cruelty, and appearance of their operations. Yeah, as many physicians, he had very strong opinions about firearms. Uh, But his improvisation in this moment and its results changed the way he looked at medicine forever, and he wrote about it. This is translated, obviously. At last, my oil ran short, and I was forced instead thereof to apply a digestive made of the yolks of eggs, oil of roses, and turpentine. In the night, I could not sleep in quiet, fearing some default in not cauterizing, that I should find the sounded to whom I had not used the said oil dead from the poison of their wounds, which made me rise very early to visit them, where beyond my expectation, I found that those to whom I had applied my digestive medicament had but little pain, and their wounds without inflammation or swelling, having rested fairly well that night. The others, to whom the boiling oil was used, I found feverish, with great pain and swelling about the edges of their wounds. Then I resolved never more to burn thus cruelly poor men with gunshot wounds. So to be clear, this was hugely risky. If these soldiers had died because of Paré's experimental treatment, not only would he have felt responsible, he also probably would have been kicked out of the military Additionally, it would have also likely ended any hope he had of being a barber surgeon beyond the battlefield. So it's really no surprise that he couldn't sleep. And this discovery that an alternate approach to treating wounds, one that did not involve pouring boiling oil on already suffering patients, was successful, gave Paré a new degree of confidence. He started to extol the virtues of observing patients and treating based on assessment of the individual rather than only going by what appeared in books as the prescribed method for a particular type of injury. He had also decided from that moment that he would only use treatments that he truly believed to be useful. So in a way, he was making a conscious decision to trust his instincts because he had always suspected that scalding oil was not the best idea, but now he had experiential proof that another approach created a far better outcome. Up to the time that he became a military medic, Paré's knowledge about surgery was like most medical professionals of the time based on the writings of Galen. Galen moved medical practice forward in a lot of ways. He clarified understanding of anatomy, particularly the circulatory system and the workings of respiration. And he also did a lot of surgeries. He cared for gladiators and accompanied Marcus Aurelius into battle to care for the troops. So he had plenty of injuries to treat and to learn from. But Galen lived in the first century, so a lot of his ideas were outdated by the time Perry was working, even though he was still a really key part of standard medical education. His writing, for example, was based on the idea of bodily humors that Hippocrates had developed. Most of the early 16th century medical profession still had an almost dogmatic devotion to following Galen's writings to the letter, even though Galen himself wrote about the importance of personal observation. Paré continued to elevate the care of wounded soldiers as a field medic and surgeon over the course of several military tours, and that dedication paid off. Uh, Although he was encouraged to stay in the military because of his usefulness, in 1541 he returned to Paris, and he was able to take the necessary examinations that he needed, and he was given the title of Master Barber Surgeon. He also got married after he went home to Paris, and he basically set himself up with a house and a shop in what is modern-day Place de Michel. Paré went back to the military in 1542 when he was selected by the Grand Lord of Brittany to be his surgeon on campaigns. It was during this phase of military touring that Paré developed a new technique for dislodging bullets from wounds by having the wounded person place their body in the position they had been in when they were shot so that he could more easily track the bullet's trajectory. That seems like such a cool and interesting thing, (laughs) rather than people digging around in wounds going, how exactly were you standing? (laughs) I see, it entered here, it probably went here. Uh, It seems so obvious, and yet was not standard at all. 
And one of the reasons that we know about Amboise Paré's experiences and his refinement of surgical techniques is because he wrote numerous books on those subjects. And we're going to talk about the beginning of his work as an author after we hear from some of the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. After he returned to Paris again, and on the advice of one of the physicians at the Faculté de Médecins, Amboise started writing about his work. And this is where not having learned Latin actually helped make him even more well-known. He wrote in French. That was unusual for medical texts. And as a consequence, it made them accessible to a far wider audience. Whereas the use of Latin in the medical field had always been a separator between the well-educated and the masses, Paré's work disregarded that divide, and to some degree, it democratized medical knowledge. Barber surgeons were no longer left out of the conversation. They were reading the exact same text as master surgeons when it came to Paré's work. The use of French for his writing also meant that translations of his works went into circulation really quickly. Soon there were printings of Paré's writings in English, German, and Dutch, and they spread quickly throughout all of Europe. And because of this, his ideas created a true watershed moment in medical history where practitioners started re-examining some pretty long-held truths. His first book was published in 1545, and it was titled The Method of Treating Wounds Made by Arquebuses and Other Firearms, Darts, and Such. Also, combustion made especially by cannon powder. So, uh, just as a quick aside, an arquebus was a long gun, sort of a precursor to the musket. And the preface to that book really evidences Paré's religious devotion. It is dedicated, quote, to young surgeons of goodwill. And after a few opening lines about how he was asked to share his knowledge of treating wounds, it reads, quote, Not presuming in my present capacity being able to teach you, for which more instruction would be necessary, but to satisfy your desire in part and also stimulate some higher spirit by writing in this way, so we can all give it greater attention. Now I ask you humbly to take this little book kindly, which, if I know you are agreeable, will cause me to do something more, such as my small mind can undertake. For such I pray the Creator, brothers and friends, to happily support our work by His grace, always increasing our good affections so that something fruitful and useful can come of it, to the support of the infirmity of human life and to the honor of the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of science, who is the eternal God. This religious reference is also reflected in a phrase that's often associated with Paré, which is, je le pensais, du le guéri, which is, I bandaged him, God cured him. Paré, with a lot of course study in his early years, you'll remember he did a lot of book learning, uh, combined with his situational experience on the battlefield, wrote about the various changes to treatments that he had developed while in military service. And this, of course, included his opinion that hot oil led to pain that could be avoided in amputation situations and that the oil could actually damage the tissue and slow healing. He continually worked to be objective about reconsidering old methods of doing things as compared to his new ideas. He never presumed that his way was better, and he always offered reasoned explanations in situations where he felt that surgeons should perhaps update their practice to include new techniques. In all of his writings, the really pervasive aspect of it is that he speaks of compassion and kindness and remembering that saving lives is worth the effort. This isn't necessarily common in medical texts at this time, so it was very unusual. And all of this led to his nickname in history as the Gentle Surgeon. In 1550, he published his second book, which was Brief Collection for the Conduct of Anatomy. And once that was out, he started editing and updating his first book for release as a second edition. Right after that second edition project, he was once again attending to soldiers on the battlefield with uh, the medics under Vicomte de Rohan. And Paré is said to have gone to great efforts to save a soldier who everyone believed was going to die. They had actually already dug a grave for him. And that his dedication to saving even the lowest ranking of the troops gained him great admiration and loyalty among the men. During this deployment, Paré started to use ligatures to tie off vessels during amputations, abandoning the use of hot iron cauterization. When the city of Metz was overwhelmed by the forces of Emperor Charles V, Amboise Paré was snuck past the occupation forces so that he could treat trapped soldiers there. 
Because of this and his extraordinary service throughout his military assignments, King Henry II of France appointed him to be one of the king's surgeons. This honor came with some strings, though, uh, because after the battles in Lorraine, Paré had returned home to his practice in Paris in 1553, only to have the king order him almost immediately to another battlefield in Edain, where the situation was quite dire, and Paré worked day and night to try to treat the overwhelming number of wounded. Things grew even more precarious when Paré was taken prisoner along with the rest of the French garrison. He disguised himself at this point as a low-ranking soldier so that his identity would not be revealed. At this point, remember, his stuff had started to be translated and spread throughout Europe, so people knew who he was. And he knew that, like, that could potentially endanger him or cause his captors to ask for a, a very high ransom. But he did continue to treat people medically during this time. And he actually managed to secure his freedom by treating an enemy officer. Uh, I believe it was for an ulcer on his leg. And he returned to King Henry II and gave his report before once again at least attempting to return to his civilian life. In 1554, his career took another step forward. He was granted the title of Master Surgeon, in part because the surgeons of the city knew it would make them look good. He became the surgeon attending King Francis II. Yeah, this is actually uh, pretty pivotal, where somebody who came up as a barber surgeon, suddenly all of the the snootier uh, levels of the medical establishment were like, no, 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 you're one of us. (laughs) You're famous and stuff. Um, He was sent on two more military campaigns at Saint-Quentin and Durlin. And when Charles IX became king of France, Paré was once again in that monarch's service. As the French wars of religion began, they dominated Paré's professional life, just as other conflicts had, because he was ordered to treat soldiers at the request of the crown, although he was sent away from Paris less and less often, likely because at this point, he was getting a bit older. Paré continued to write, and in 1564, he released a highly illustrated project titled Ten Books of Surgery with the Magazine of the Instruments Necessary for It. He also developed a specialized clamp called a bec de corbin, which is a crow's beak, and that would help hold a vessel closed to keep patients from bleeding out. This was used in cases where a wound had severed the vessel and the surgeon could quickly stem the bleeding with the clamp to improve survival rates. He also invented a number of other clamps with similarly charming names. The bec de grue, in English, that's the crane's beak, uh, and another called a duck's beak, that's a bec de can, were both developed for bullet extraction. These were long and thin, uh, so they could reach deep into the tissue to get to a bullet without having to widen the entry wound too much. That was an ongoing problem. Again, Paré's focus on preserving the tissue and treating the patient as gently as possible is driving his innovation. Gentle handling of patients and their tissue was just a really important part of Paré's writing and work. It was accepted and also expected that patients would have incredible pain during surgery. If you recall our episode on Scottish surgeon Robert Liston, which was in the 1800s, you may remember that he became famous for his speed at surgical procedures and was deemed to be a showboater because of it. But his real goal with that was to keep the patient's pain as brief as possible. Similarly, Amboise Paré, several centuries before that, was also trying to be as brief as possible with the scalpel and to be as gentle as he possibly could in the hopes of minimizing suffering. Long before it was customary, Amboise Paré was encouraging the medical profession to embrace the idea of pain management for patients, as well as more comprehensive follow-up care on the part of the surgeon. So he, like a lot of people, dispensed opium for post-op recovery, although this wasn't just like a, a blanket thing to knock people out. He was trying to really, like, carefully determine how much they needed to help them with their pain. And at a time when surgeons typically kind of performed a procedure and then left any aftercare to physicians and nurses, he believed in remaining part of the recovery team for the patient after that surgery was completed. When Charles IX died in 1574, Paré remained the king's surgeon under the new regent. That was Charles's brother, Henry III. He was also elevated to the position of valet de chambre. Paré served Henry III until the king's assassination in 1589. In 1575, Paré published his complete works of Amboise Paré, counselor and premier surgeon of the king. 
This volume gathered together all of his writings on surgery and medicine into one, and it was edited and revised as needed. And it was so popular that it had multiple edition runs over the course of the following century. In 1634, it was translated into English for publication in London. In 1585, his last book, Apology and Treatise, was released, And this became his most famous work. It was part medical discussion, part autobiography. It covered his medical career during the 50 years from 1535 until its publication. At its heart, it was a drama because it was a response to criticism from his contemporary, Etienne Gourmelin, who was dean of the Faculté de Médecine. Gourmelin's own writing on surgery had never been as popular as Paré's, and it definitely led to some tension. In 1581, Gourmelin wrote a book about surgical techniques in which he criticized Paré's amputation ligatures. Yeah, I think it probably ground his gears a little bit that he was a more of a trained and educated surgeon, and yet no one was listening to him when a barber surgeon had gotten famous written books and everyone wanted to read them. Apology and Treatise takes on these criticisms of Gourmelin's and outlines the many ways in which Paré shifted thinking in the medical community throughout his career. Basically, he's establishing his street cred, and then he kind of addresses the actual criticism. And the whole thing is also written with the usual careful analysis and logic that he became famous for, including detailed case histories that supported his work. And this whole thing was a huge humiliation for Gourmelin. I'm just like, Gormelin, you shouldn't have been a jerk then. (laughs) He allegedly wrote a response to it that was written anonymously, and it's kind of this, like, weak, well, you don't know kind of paper that he, uh, I can't remember if it was written anonymously or if he had one of his students publish it under their name, but Gormelin did not really get over it, but he was shamed. (laughs) That sadly brings us to the end of Amboise Paré's life. He died at home in bed on December 20th, 1590, at the age of 80. Yeah, I I literally had this moment where I was doing the math on the length of his career, and I was like, wait, he couldn't have been practicing medicine for 50 years? Yes. Yeah. 50 years. Um, At a time when I, I wonder how many people even had any career for 50 years, particularly one that changed the way that people practice medicine and He undoubtedly, I mean, he saved a lot of lives directly himself, but uh, there's no real way to measure how many lives were made better or saved because other doctors were like, I think he's onto something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Amboise Paré, thank you for suggesting being gentle. That was nice. (laughs) Do you have some listener mail to take us out? I do. I have a couple of of mails uh, about our Sonora Webster Carver episode. One is from Stephanie, who writes, Hey, gals, I saw the movie in fifth grade history class and had no idea what it was called and was starting to feel like I had dreamed it up. I was enjoying the podcast like all others. And then you got to the part where she went blind and I thought, oh, wait, it's that movie. I then waited excitedly for you to get to that part, and I'm glad you guys covered this topic so I don't have to keep wondering about that vague memory of a film I saw back in the early 90s. Thank you for the last 10, 15 years of this podcast. I go back to when it was the five-minute format where it was posed as a question, which was always funny since the answer was always in the title. Uh, That is from Stephanie, and she sent a picture of two kitties. They are two gorgeous orange boys named Bunsen and Beaker, and they are super beautiful. And I hope that they, like most orange kitties, are very snuggly. They look it. They're definitely very snuggly with each other in this picture. So good. Oh, they're so cute. I want to hug it. Uh, I also wanted to read another Sonora Webster Carver email from our listener, Rebecca, who writes, I discovered your podcast about five years ago when I was attending grad school for theater in London, and I've enjoyed every episode since. That sounds like a fabulous story in and of itself. I want to get that whole backstory. Uh, She writes, I was so excited to see your episode of Sonora Webster Carver in my feed. I'm from a town right outside of Atlantic City, and my family has been tied to the city for four generations. My mom's china cabinet is dedicated to pieces her grandparents stole from some of the hotels they worked in from the 1920s and 30s, and she was one of the original showgirls at resorts, which was the first casino to open. But I am most proud of my family history, 
uh, with Atlantic City is that my grandmother was the first female bank teller in the city. I remember hearing stories from my grandmother about seeing Sonora and the diving horses when she was a little girl. The idea of it always freaked me out, but it was great actually learning about Sonora's life. I was a little girl when they wanted to bring the diving horses or donkeys back, and I remember the controversy around it. Atlantic City has such a fascinating and rich history, and I cannot thank you enough for this episode. It is always nice to hear a podcast that connects me to home. Um, so fun. What a fabulous family history. Uh, Rebecca, I hope you write a story about all of this because it sounds great. Uh, and thank you so much for writing in. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us anywhere on social media as Missed in History. And if you have not yet subscribed, we think you should. That would be grand. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.